St. Patrick Born sometime around 386 AD in Britain. Much of his life is still unknown and cannot be verified. When Patrick was just 16, he was taken by Irish invaders and brought back to Ireland as a slave to tend animals and sheep. During his captivity, he became devoted to Christianity and prayer. In a vision, he saw the hands of children from pagan Ireland in need of help and grew a strong determination to invite Christianity to the island of Ireland. After six years of enslavement, Patrick managed to escape by boarding a ship which set sail and landed in France. Whilst here, we believe he studied to become a priest. Around 432, he arrived back in Ireland with a hope of teaching the faiths of Christianity to the Irish people. Unbeknownst to the people of Wicklow, this very beach beside the Black Castle may have been one of the first places he may have arrived returning to the island. Arriving at the beach here in Wicklow, stories tell of an unfriendly welcome in which the locals out of fear due to maybe Patrick's fatigues or the sight of foreign monks. They threw down stones from overhead hitting Patrick and the followers. One of his followers was hit by a rock, knocking out his front teeth. This monk adopted the name of Mantan, meaning gummy. Later, he set up church here in Kilmantan, meaning Gubby's church, or church of the toothless one. The Black Castle of Wicklow Town has a very well established history. The site of Wicklow was first chosen and taken by Vikings, who we have learned may have firstly invaded the town sometime in the 9th century, and given us quite a few names. Most notably, the original name of Vikinglow. Also noted are the names Vikingalo and Ikerlo, which roughly translates to Meadow of the Vikings and Meadow of the Bay. Back then, a lot of Irish settlements were mostly scattered and built along the coast and near a landmark, such as a monastery or a church, making it an easy target for invading Viking parties to attack and plunder before moving inland. The first recorded Viking raid in Irish history occurred in 795 AD by Vikings possibly from Norway or somewhere else in Scandinavia. These raiding parties from Scandinavia were also known as Norsemen, Northmen, or most commonly known as the Normans. Bringing us forward to the 12th century, Dermot McMorrow, born sometime between 1090 to 1110 AD, succeeded the throne from his father in 1126, before becoming the King of Leinster. McMurra would soon become a household name in the history of Ireland. He was known as potentially being the first man to invite the English to Irish soil and leading a long line of bloodshed and tyranny upon our small island. Tiernan O'Rourke, the King of Breffney and McMurra had a dispute which firstly started when he became the King of Leinster. Turlock O'Connor, who was the High King of Ireland at the time, was unhappy about this ruling, sent his allied king to oust the new king from his throne by slaughtering livestock and burning farms. After almost two decades of unrest, McMurrah is said to have kidnapped the wife of O'Rourke around the year 1153. The High King of this time, Rory O'Connor, was very unpleased with this. So alongside his fellow Irish chieftains, they banished McMorrow for his actions. McMorrow fled to France. Unpleased and refusing to accept his defeat and exile, he made his way to the court of King Henry II of England, where McMorrow had offered to become a vassal of Henry's in exchange for military aid 
in retaking his kingdom. King Henry II was at this point in control of what is known as the Angevin Empire, which stretched from England to France. He did not directly provide assistance, but he did allow MacMurrah to petition to Anglo-Norman lords throughout his land. Lord Richard de Clare, second Earl of Pembroke, who was also known as Strongbow, agreed to lead an army to Ireland. In 1167, MacMorrow returned to Ireland with a group of adventurers who recaptured Wexford and Waterford and then waited for Strongbow to arrive. Upon his arrival, they continued north and captured all of Leinster. In 1169, King Henry II granted the lands of the east coast of Ireland to Strongbow because he had fears that Strongbow and the other lords would gain too much power in Ireland and use it as a staging post for another Norman invasion of England. MacMurrah, at this point, with no real army of his own, thought of a way to cement an alliance with Strongbow and his men. MacMurrah married his daughter Aoife to Strongbow in 1170, and the following year, MacMurrah passed away. In 1176, Strongbow granted the land surrounding Wicklow coast to the Baron Maurice Fitzgerald on the condition that he was to build a number of castles and forts. But rumour has it the Baron died shortly thereafter. It is believed the castle was then either handed, taken or sieged by the then chief governor, Fitz Audelin. The Black Castle over hundreds of years seems to have changed hands multiple times, most notably by the O'Byrne and the O'Toole clans, from being burnt down to being rebuilt by another conquering clan. It was then attacked by the O'Toole's in 1641, and numerous times up until the building was completely destroyed in 1646. 424 years roughly it may have stood, and been used as a stronghold. In later years, at some stage, part of it may have been rebuilt and used as a garrison, but by the end of that century the garrison had moved elsewhere and the castle may have sat derelict and decaying since then. There has been evidence to suggest that the castle would have been built on a pre-existing fort. The now remains of the castle show us that it may have been a triangular shaped keep, which can be seen from an aerial view. Today it can be accessed by crossing a deep foss with a flight of steps cut into the stone of the cliffs, which are still accessible and still used to this day. There are also a set of steps carved into the cliffs at the rear of the castle, which would have been used to carry supplies directly from the boats from the deck to the castle. Hundreds of years of erosion have worn them away almost completely and can now only be seen from the water down below. Dotted around the site are cannons in place which may have been an example of the British control over the small town or maybe they are just a mural to show the strategic position the castle may have had if attacked from sea. We did notice a few cannons may have had a rig of some sort that may have been used as a swinging motion for the cannons, but we were unable to clarify this. <laughs>